In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, to Allah alone do I submit and seek refuge. I thank Allah for Moses and the scriptures that he brought called the Torah. And I thank Allah for Jesus and the scripture that he brought called the Injil or the Good News, what you call the New Testament. And I thank Allah for Muhammad and the revelation of the Holy Quran. Peace be upon all of these worthy servants of God. But I don't think uh, I could thank Allah enough for raising up a man in our midst to teach us the book and the wisdom and give us understanding of those scriptures that Allah sent to all of the prophets. And that man of whom I speak is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, brothers and sisters, I'm, of course, very happy to see you, to be here at Mosque Mariam, and I'm very happy to be broadcasting at this very moment over radio station WBEE. Today is December the 17th, approximately eight days before the celebration of what is commonly called Christmas. And I know that many in our listening audience, and some of you probably, have gotten your Christmas greeting cards and You've sent them out to your friends, and some of you really didn't know how you were going to pay the rent this month, but you found a little money to buy a Christmas tree. And uh, you were busy decorating your trees and getting ready for the holidays. Holiday is another way of saying holy day and a holiday or a holy day is a day that carries great significance with the people who celebrate if we're talking about a simple holiday such as Valentine's Day or this one's birthday or that one's birthday, we might expect some frivolity, really maybe some light insanity. But when you talk about the birthday of the man Jesus, that should be one of the holiest Days, not only in the history of America, but it should be one of the holiest days in the history of all humanity. Shouldn't it? Or you may ask, why should it be? Why should the birthday of Jesus be holy? in every society on the earth. If we properly understand, and I'm going to be as to the point as possible because this audience, both the listening audience and those of you who are present at Mosque Mariam, you have a basis for what I'm about to say.
The birthday of Jesus should be sacred to every nation and every people because since the fall of Adam, all humanity has suffered a loss and a death that is only corrected when this highly prophesied individual comes into the world. The death that the human family has experienced is the death of the spirit, the death of the mind that would allow us to be reflections of the divine supreme being so that man today man and woman are so far beneath what we should be and what we could be that our condition is a stench in the nostrils of God Humanity, black, brown, red, yellow, and white, are actually dead. Not physically, but spiritually. In the book of Revelations, John the Revelator says, And I beheld a pale horse. Its rider is death, and hell follows closely behind. I beheld a pale horse. It didn't say a white horse. It said a pale horse. Horse as a beast is the most intelligent of the beasts. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that we do not eat horse meat, not because horse meat is not a good meat to eat, but that the horse in its intelligence is so close to the human being that as we do not eat the flesh of another human being out of respect for our humanity, we don't eat the flesh of the heart out of respect for its great intelligence. And I saw a pale heart an intelligent creature who is pale but a member of the family of beasts not human intelligent not human but the highest manifestation of beasts mm. The rider of the horse is death. The word rider and the word rudder have some significance. A rudder is a small member of a huge boat. And it is the rudder that turns the boat in the water. Right? What is the rider and how does the rider compare to the rudder? The thing that gives man or woman direction is your intelligence. Your intelligence or the nature of you 
is small in comparison to the body, but it is what turns you and moves you about in the world as the turning of the rudder moves a great ship about. Death is the rider of the pale heart. Isn't that something? Death is the guiding principle of the pale people. What do you call death? The Bible puts it like this. Sin is transgression of the law and the wages of rebellion to the law brings death. So here the Bible writer is telling us that a pale horse is being ridden by a mind driven by a force within its being that is in direct rebellion to the law and the will of God. So wherever the pale horse goes with death as its rider, hell follows closely behind. You with me? Now, the pale horse the pale faith, the pale people, highly intelligent but not human. Highly intelligent but not intelligent enough to be humane in its actions towards self and the rest of the human family of the earth. The pale horse whose rider, whose nature, whose governing principle is rebellion to the law of God. So that whatever God says thou shalt do, white folks say it's all right, you don't have to. Come on. Their whole way of life is rebellion to the law of God, to the way of God, to the mind of God. So they in their person represent death to the mind and spirit of God in the human family. When they spread their way over the Indian, over the black, over the brown, over the red, over the yellow, over themselves, they have spread death over the human family so that all of us have accepted a principle of life, a guiding principle that is rebellion to the will and law of God. So in that rebellion, we have died spiritually, mentally, and morally socially, politically, economically. The death and dismemberment of the human family is due to our rebellion against the law of life. Follow me, please. Many of you fix your hair, you get a curly, wave a perm and sometimes you go to the store and you buy your perm and you do it yourself and if you buy your perm and do it yourself the first thing you do when you buy it you go inside to get out the directions of how to use that bad boy because if you don't use it right, you may come up totally bald. Is that right? <laughs> and if you can't read, you better have somebody read the directions to you. Everything that is made 
of a chemical nature or medicinal nature or of technology comes with instruction. You with me? If you want to do it right, you follow the instruction. If you want to mess it up, you innovate or you rebel. Now, those of you who are blessed to have an automobile, when you buy it new, in the glove compartment you will see owner's manual. And it's telling you about a machine that you purchased but did not make. You are the owner, but you are not the maker. So the maker has a right to tell the owner how that automobile should be cared for if you want to get the best out of the engine. Is that right? Out of the automobile. Well now, you didn't make human beings. Therefore, you cannot be said to be the owner of another human being. You may exercise stewardship over their lives by God's permission, but you should never see yourself as the owner of another human being. You don't own your wife. You are the husband or the caretaker of someone that you did not make. Huh? Someone that even you, mother, or you say, that's my child, I made it, I do it what I want. Not necessarily so. You weren't conscious of nothing. You didn't put one conscious thought into making nothing. You either fell in love or lust. One of those two. And something happened and you said, mm -mm, I am pregnant. You had a decision to make, let it be, or do something about it. Whatever you did, that's your decision. But evidently somebody didn't do anything about it and we are here. Or they tried to and failed. Anyway, we are here. But they had no conscious thought in the, in the process of the making. God, the originator, was doing the making using what he created in the life germ to form and fashion us in the wombs of our mothers. Is that right? Yes, what I'm trying to get you to see is that since God, you may call him Allah, you may call him Jehovah, you may call him by a host of many great names, but I'm talking about the originator of life. Since he is the originator of our lives, who is best qualified to tell us how to use what he created? Come on. You want to get the best out of this? You're not doing so good, you know. You're not doing too good. Look at your condition. Your condition says you need somebody to help you get the maximum out of the life that you didn't give yourself. God gave you life. Why shouldn't God have the sovereign right to tell us how to get the maximum out of a heart, out of lungs, out of our kidneys, out of this magnificent creation? God and God alone is the proper, the natural, sovereign, king, ruler, 
Lord, governor, teacher, guide over what he created. Is that right? Now, if we submit to God and let him guide us, we have life on every plane of existence. We not only have physical life, we have mental, moral, spiritual, social, economic, and political life. But the moment we decide, hey God, you lay out, cool it. I got this. I'm running this show. I'm directing my affair. Death comes in. Now, the pale horse, the pale intelligent being that is not yet human but highly intelligent, considered a member of the family of beasts, but not humane in its treatment of himself or the environment or anybody else. He did not want God to tell him what to do. He told God, cool it, man. I'm running this show. So God stepped back and said, okay, baby, run. I'll be over here when you need me because you're sure going to need me soon. And white folks have messed up the world. They messed up their lives. They have messed up a beautiful country. They have built it up. Oh, this is a great country. The cities are beautiful. The roads are fine. But they killed the environment. They're killing the earth. They're killing the atmosphere. Yes, they poison the water, the earth, and the air. Now they are dying from their own hand, their own rebellion. And they have spread their rebellious way over you, over me, over Africa, over Asia. Central and South America. The whole world has been deceived by the arch deceiver. He has come to you in the name of God because you by nature have a respect for God, but he cleverly stands in the place of God giving directions that are misdirections giving you guidance that is no guidance, giving you falsehood in the place of truth, creating a hell for the whole world. And I saw a pale horse whose rider was death, and hell followed closely behind. Everywhere the pale man went, he brought death and hell to the inhabitants of that part of the earth. Wait a minute, am I lying? Is not this their history? In Tahiti, in the Isles of the Pacific, don't white folk call that paradise? They don't call it that now. After he got there, it was paradise lost because he brought his way, he brought death, and hell came right behind. Africa, come on, death is over Africa, and hell is over Africa. Death is in the Caribbean, death is in Central and South America, and hell is there because the pale horse is there. But what has that got to do with Christmas, brother? If a man rebels against 
against God. How then can his holiday be a true praise of God? Come on. The world of Caucasian life is full of rebellion. They are so confused today, they don't know what's right or wrong anymore. Here's a man that wants to be a woman. Wait. And he was ordained in the church. Just yesterday it was on the news. Now, can you imagine what kind of congregation he's going to produce? He said, well, I'm holy, I'm righteous, and all of that. <laughs> and they say, well, you know, that old law, that was for way back then. That ain't got nothing to do with me now. I mean, time moves on. This is a different time period. Don't come up with that old stuff about God don't like men loving men. God is love, honey. What's wrong with me loving another human being, even if it's a male? There's nothing wrong with you loving your fellow man in the proper way. But now people are so confused, they don't know right from wrong anymore. You know, the scripture says that in the last days, we would be so turned upside down. We would take darkness for light and light for darkness. We would take heaven for hell and hell for heaven. We would take God for the devil and the devil for God. You just about reached that point. You're so upside down today till you don't know anymore what is right because you do not listen to the nature of yourself which is constantly telling you, uh-uh, don't do that. And you say, shut up. I know what I'm doing. This pale horse has messed up the world. Now, I'm going to make a, a, a very quick statement to justify what I'm about to say. God knew that the pale horse was coming. God knew that the rider would be death. God knew that hell would follow death. He said, let it be. Why? Because he understood what we didn't understand. If sometimes you don't let a child fry in his or her own fat, they won't allow you to take them out of the frying pan. Sometimes a wise father or mother will say, all right, son, go ahead. Knowing that you're going to get wrapped up in something that's going to wrap you up. Knowing that when you get tied up so tight that you can't breathe, you have just enough strength to holler out, Help! <laughs> and then mom and dad would say, Did you hear something? Did you hear anything? And after you holler a little louder till you get totally exasperated, 
Then mama said, well, I'll help you get out of that. That's the way God is. He's trying to teach you that the way of rebellion is not the right way. The way of submission to God, that is the right way. That is the only way. Because God who gave us life and is the master of all circumstances is the only one qualified to guide the life that he originated. Therefore, he offers you obedience. And you and I reject it. And then he said, fine, go your way. And when you get into so much difficulty, he sends a prophet. You ready to come out of this now? By that time, you may say yes, or you may say, will you come straighten us out? I don't want no straightening out. And you try to kill the prophet. Now you're already removed from God by your rebellion. Now when you try to kill a man that would tell you the truth to bring you back to yourself and to God, then God will kill you. That's when he don't show no more mercy to you, he will kill you. And that's the condition that the white man is in. That's the condition that the government of America is in. And whether you know it or not, that's the condition that you're in right now. You're facing death. You, you and I either are going to obey God and get off the pale horse. And I saw a black horse. And on it was a rider that had scales in his hand. Justice. I wonder which horse you would like to ride. I'm sick of being ruled over by the high intelligence of a people and a government and a world that is less than human. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't want to be ruled by white people no more. I don't want it. You want to be ruled by black people? No. Not in the condition that we're in. I want to be ruled by God. I want God's way of life. Listen, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us one day, it takes approximately 75 years for you to learn how to live. <laughs> That's a long time. If the Bible only gives you three score and ten, you just getting on the threshold of learning how to live and it's time to get out of here. That's why in the church you see so many old people. It's not because they're getting ready to die and they just want to go to church. Older people have learned how to live. They just don't have any more the strength or the power to do what they have learned. But the longer you live, you learn that you don't know. And it takes you 75 years to try out all your madness. And by the time you reach 75 years, you're ready to throw up your hands and say, Lord, I surrender. I don't know what I'm doing. I have never known what I was doing. I messed up my life, my children's lives, 
my grandchildren alive, Lord, if I can just live a few more years, help me to obey your will. And that's why grandmama will tell the children, child, obey God. They know that thing from experience. This is not words. Grandmama lived long enough to stumble down so many flights of stairs, so many hills, into so many valleys that she can tell us all, child, if you want to be successful in life, obey God. Now, white folks, the pale horse, brought us into slavery, didn't they? They said they were Christians, didn't they? But you sing a song, you can tell that we are Christians by our what? By our love. Well, you can tell that they are devils by their hate. Is that right? But look, look at how slick the devil is. He don't want to come straight out and say, you know who I am? I'm the devil. I'm here to give you hell all the days of your life until you wake up and find out who I am. But I'm going to deceive you, trick you, lie to you, cheat you, kill you, beat you, jail you. That's my role. You know the devil is not going to talk like that. The devil will come saying, I am an agent of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the wicked always come in the name of one that your nature will make you respect. That's why the worst liars are those who come in the name of God. Come on. The worst hypocrites are those who come in the name of God. If you want to put it over, come in the name of somebody that somebody loves. Look, brother, sister, that's the way deceit is. If somebody wants to deceive you, they don't come in, in their name because their name doesn't carry any weight. Come in the name of somebody you respect. That's why, as an intelligent people, we got to look behind the name that people come in and see whether the works are equivalent to the name. I come in the name of Jesus. Fine, come in. But let me check your works. Now, white folk came to us in the name of Jesus. That's the name of the ship that our fathers got on to come into America as slaves. The ship had a good name on it, but it was a good name used to shield a dirty religion. Jesus' teaching was true and proper and right and pure, but the actions of those Christians, so-called, who came to trap our fathers was a dirty action. Come on. Well, we're here now. The ship has gone back wherever it is or is no longer in existence. We're here. What's your condition? <laughs> you in hell, brother. You followed the pale horse and you are dead in hell. Merry Christmas. <laughs> now, how could your Christmas be merry? Talk to me. Here you are, don't know yourself. 
don't know God, don't know the enemy of God, wearing the white man's name, speaking the white man's language, got the white man's learning in your brain, have no money in your pocket, don't live in a decent home, you have hardly any friend that you can trust. You are friendless. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What makes it merry? Well, I looked under my tree. And what? I saw some gifts under there. And I was so glad that somebody gave me a pair of gloves that didn't fit. A tie that was the ugliest tie I've ever seen. A sweater. But it's not the gift, it's the thought. Merry Christmas. Get out the eggnog, fam. Eggnog? What's that got to do with Jesus? Shut up! Get the eggnog. me drink to your health until I lose my own. Get the brandy. Get the corvassier. Not beer, not today. Beer is for every other day. But today, bring the best wine, the best brandy, the best whiskey, J and B. Scotch, bring the reefer, bring the cocaine, bring the crack, bring your pipe. <laughs> bring your paper and we'll roll a few together. Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas. tonight. Isn't there going to be a Christmas party? Well, let me get my head tight, get my head bad so I can go to the party. Who's going to be at the party? Lucy May, Cindy, Lucille. You know, fine Lucille. <laughs> Merry Christmas, y'all. We're going to party till the wee hours of the morning. Merry Christmas, y'all. What has that got to do with Jesus Christ? <laughs> Turn on your television. Buy the new car. Buy the refrigerator. Buy the diamond. Buy the this. Buy the that. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? This is commercial. That's why the pale horse whose rider is death and hell follows closely behind. You got to watch any holy day that the pale horse sets up because it's a mockery of the Holy One because the pale horse cannot show respect for divine <laughs> Merry Christmas come on step under the mistletoe honey <laughs> ho 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 Claus has moved Jesus out. These children are more interested in Santa than in Jesus. What is that big fat cracker going to leave under my tree this year? You become a lying mother. A deceit mother lying to your children there's some cracker from the North Pole that don't even know you exist is going to slip down a chimney and you live in an apartment if you 
you're not living at O'Hare or one of the homeless. Santa dropping nothing on them. You say, but it's just a little fun. It's a little white lie. Like that pale horse. When you damage the confidence of your children with a lie, that sets into motion a whole chain reaction that breaks their confidence in you. It hurts children to learn that you lied to them. You call it fun. It's never fun to lie to your children. It is better that you tell your children, I'm the Santa Claus baby. And me and your daddy worked hard all year to save up money to get you these gifts. And uh, we hope you like them. Why let the love and the gratitude go to a Caucasian image? Why not let your children show you the love for what you gave them? Give you the honor and the respect for what you gave them. Why give that to some blue-eyed, blonde-haired, fat cracker that have no thought for you? And then, when your children grow up, you wonder why they always expect white people to give them something because you start them off as children looking to the enemy to give them what you've given them all along. Lie. It's not a holiday or holy day. You've corrupted that day. And you've made mockery of the most sacred human being of all. Merry Christmas. Look, look at the name Christmas. You have two words there, Christ and Mass. Do you know what it means? A Mass is a group of people organized for the purpose of the worship of Christ. Christ man. Not you. You're not organized on Christmas for the worship of Christ. Talk to me. That's just a day that you ain't got to go to work. Everybody gets drunk, has a ball, party in the name of Jesus. Some few of you will go to a midnight mass. Some others of you will go to church and sing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, hark the herald angels sing. Oh, holy night, you just got up from unholiness. Oh, holy night. This is hypocrisy. And you know why? Because December the 25th was never the birthday of Christ. Uh-oh, I may have struck a nerve here. Don't jump up and run now. Wait a minute. Who told you that Jesus was born on December the 25th? Who told you? The same person that told you you was a nigga. Come on! <laughs> it's the pale horse. <laughs> now I'm with you if the pale horse told the truth, but the pale horse lied again. And there were Shepherds abiding in the field, 
tending their flock by when? By night. Have you ever been to Palestine around December the 25th? Go on over there and see if you see any shepherds in the field tending their flocks by night. It's winter over there. They don't tend their flocks by night in the winter. The scholars will tell you that they don't know when Jesus was born because the birth of Jesus was a carefully guarded secret because the enemies wanted to kill him at birth. So in order to keep Jesus from being killed, they had to hide the time of his birth. Talk to me. Come on. The scholars say, and you can do some serious research on this, that when they tend their flocks by night, they say September to early October, they give the time period that Jesus may have been born, but certainly not December. Well, how did they get that date? Now, how many of you have gotten Christmas cards that said, Merry Xmas? Xmas. Have you ever seen that? You don't have to get shy. I want to see you raise your hand. If you, how many of you seen that Xmas? Xmas. Xmas. Well, couldn't they say Merry Christmas? Why Xmas? What is the X? Because the mass of people are gathered to worship they know not what. X stands for the unknown. They don't know when Jesus was born, and most of you don't even know who you're worshiping. Mm -mm -mm. On December the 25th. Now follow me, we're going to get it sweet. It's going to be all right. Even if you've got your tree, you know, it's going to be all right. Just take it down and throw it away and don't buy one no more. Now, how many of you got Bibles at home? I got one. I didn't bring my Bible with me, but I got mine. But I want you to go home, open your Bible to Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. I wish I had my Bible so I could read it. In the 10th chapter of Jeremiah, God says, Learn not the way of the heathen. For the heathen goes into the forest and cuts down a tree. And he brings it into his house and he fastens it. And he decks it with silver and gold. What do you do? You didn't go into the forest and cut the tree down, but the heathen did. And he got them all out here on 95th Street, all down Stony. There's a whole lot of trees. And poor you, trees when I was coming up used to be a quarter, 50 cents. Now you pay from 25 to 75 to $100 for a tree. I just got to have me a tree. What you going to do with it? bring it in my living room and fasten it down. Some of you nail it down, right? And you get your little gold tinsel they used to do in my day when we used to dress the tree. We used to dress it, doctor. And you put your little um, tinsel balls on the tree. Where'd that come from? What are them balls all about? You don't know. You just put the balls on the tree. You should know what you're doing. 
Why are you doing it? Well, I, I don't know. This is what white folks uh, was doing. And I'm just copying white folks. I, they put balls on their tree. I put the same balls on my tree. I know white folks is right. I know they right. Whatever white folks do, it's got to be right. Give me some balls and me put it on the tree. brought me my Bible, or a Bible, and I think you'd like to hear this. Boy, Jeremiah, don't play, doctor. <laughs> Y'all all right? You're not going to be mad at me for telling you the truth, are you? For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver, with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. They must be born or carried, because they cannot move themselves. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is in them to do good. Now, you got a tree, and you think the tree is holy. You can't have a decent honor of Jesus without a tree. And you don't find nothing in the scripture that says, and Jesus said, if you want to honor my birth, go and cut down a tree. <laughs> Come on. And when you cut it down, nail it in your living room. And I want you to go to J.C. Penney's and Lord and Taylor and buy yourself silly giving gifts because the wise men gave me gifts so you all ought to get yourself totally broke giving what you don't have. Here endeth the lesson. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Is this what you're doing? Some of you are broke this Christmas, haven't recovered from last Christmas. And you're about to go broke again, buying trinkets for people you don't love and don't love you. Well, it's tradition. And you sit down looking at your television and every minute there's some Christmas commercial. Not a Jesus commercial. Nothing talking about the Lord. Everything talking about buy this, buy that, send to this, send to that, the reindeer this, the reindeer that, Mother Claus and Santa Claus. Merry Christmas. Why December the 25th? Now listen, listen, listen. It already told you in Jeremiah, do not learn the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of the heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them don't follow the heathen why are you talking about the signs of the heaven why are the heathen dismayed at the signs of the heaven the heathen worshiped the sun are you with me they did not know the true God. They worshiped the sun. And every year, you have what is called the winter solstice, which takes place around the 21st day of December. And the 21st day of December is the shortest day 
of the year. So the people who worship the sun saw the days getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And on December the 21st, it looked to them as though their God stood still. And then from December 21st on, the days start getting longer and longer every day. After December the 21st, the days get longer. So the heathen would go out and appeal to the sun god. When the sun god seemed to be going away from them. Are you listening? Yes, sir. So on the 21st, during the winter solstice, it appeared as though the sun stood still and their prayers were accepted. So since in Christian thinking, the man Jesus is called the Son of God, the heathen, when they accepted Christianity, they brought their heathen practice into the worship of Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? So Jesus, the Son of God, the light of the world, so as the sun stands still on December 21st and the days start getting longer by the 25th, they fixed the birth of Jesus to coincide with the longer days of the sun. Are you listening? So they said Jesus was born on December 25th. And you can bring me any scholar or preacher of religion. And I defy you to go in the Bible and tell me when Jesus was born. You can't do it. Neither can the scholars do it. God only knows when that man was born because his birth and his mother Mary, she knew. And Mary's not here to tell you. And God has kept it a well God is secret. So they have been left to fabricate his birth. Let me deal with this sun worship. You see the light that you put in the window? I don't know why you're putting lights in your window. Commonwealth Edison is exceedingly happy. It has been a Merry Christmas for them. Wait till you get the bill. It won't be too merry when you get the bill. All these homes decked with all these lights. Notice the shape of the light is like a flame. Sorry about that, baby. I'm just trying to educate mommy and daddy. I didn't mean to upset you. You notice in all the windows they have a candle? Because the heathen, in treating the sun, would light a candle and go out with their candle. So now in your window, you have little candles with little lights on it that go into a point like the flame on a candle. Huh? You have the pretty light. Then you have the holly wreath. Is that right? Don't you put it on your door in your window? The wreath is round like the sun. Come on. You just an old pagan sun worshiper. And you think you worship in Jesus Christ. You went to the liquor store. Now that man has had a Merry Christmas. Now he really got the Christmas spirit. The liquor merchant, and none of them is you. They have the best time at Christmas because you buy more liquor on Christmas 
than you buy any other time of the year. Come on. Merry Christmas. Sun worshippers. Actually, the person who was born on that day, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me and to us, is a man named Nimrod. <laughs> Nimrod was one of the most wicked men who ever lived. Nimrod is the man that broke the civilization of Moses. Seventeen centuries after Moses and three centuries before Jesus was born into the world, Nimrod destroyed the law of Moses. That's what they mean when they say he broke the civilization of Moses, he made the law of Moses of non-effect. And when you make the law that Moses established of non-effect, you have busted up the civilization of Moses. Nimrod was a man that had a strange relationship with his mother. Her name was Semiramis. Read about it. And when she died, they say an evergreen tree rose up out from her grave and they would put gifts under the tree. So here you are. in what the heathens practice who worship Nimrod and his mother both of them rebels against God now let's come on back to that pale heart whose rider is death and hell followed closely behind he's a rebel against God so he must God and Jesus by having a day for Jesus on the same day as the birth of Nimrod, the enemy of God. And the way you practice on December the 25th, you cannot tell me that you are honoring Jesus Christ. You are honoring Nimrod, the man who broke the divine law, which was the basis of Jesus Christ's message. Oh, man, you son. You drunk on Christmas. Most of you will probably not you, Bushman. Not you. I hope not. But most of you that are just hearing this for the first time, you had planned a fast for Christmas. Come on. Yes, you did. Oh, man, your boyfriend is coming in town. You ain't married. It don't make no difference. That's my boyfriend. What you gonna do Christmas Eve? That's none of your business, Paracard. You gonna roll your reaper? Because you're going to get your head bad for Christmas. Aren't you? Most of you. Yes, you are. You're going to break the law given by Moses. Moses said, The Lord your God is one God. Thou shalt have none other God beside him. Don't make a graven image. Don't set up any likeness. Don't bow down to them nor worship them. You're going to stop breaking the law, bowing down to statues. In fact, you got a statue in the church of Mary, of Joseph, of the uh, crib or the manger, and the little baby in it. And people coming, looking at the statue as though they're looking at something holy. Come on! Oh, yeah, you're going to break some law that day. And you 
you're going to be happy doing it. You done bought your ham. <laughs> Big old Georgia ham. And you ready to kind of sort of spice it up with sugar and put the cloves in it and slip it in the oven. You're going to have pig from the 24th on. Just going to eat up all the hog you can put in your mouth. Merry Christmas. Breaking the law that God gave to Moses. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. He said not just not to eat it. Don't touch its flesh. Don't even go in the neighborhood where it's being cooked and treated. That's your book. Break the law. Not only not touch it, you're going to touch it. Eat it, share it with your friends. Come on and sit down and have some hog. That's what Nimrod would do. <coughs> Don't step under that mistletoe. That means you got to kiss me. Spitting in my mouth, sharing your age. You know, nasty mouth thing, you're going to kiss somebody. You're going to drink more eggnog with rum in it, whiskey in it. Come on. And you'll be so drunk come midnight. You and your boyfriend, you and your girlfriend, or you and somebody else's husband. You and somebody else's wife. Having a good time, you say. Merry Christmas, baby. <laughs> Breaking the law. Breaking the law. Some of you ain't got no Christmas. You planning, though. You say, man, there ain't gonna be no Christmas. If I can't have none, I ain't got no money. Get my gun. <laughs> you gonna rob somebody so you can have a Christmas. You already planned your second story job. Merry Christmas. Your Merry Christmas is somebody else's sad Christmas. Come on, Nimrod, you're breaking the law. Is that a holiday? Is that a holy day? Is that the way you honor and respect the divine servant of God? No. But that's what's going to happen because that pale horse, a rebel against God and a liar, used Jesus' name to shield his dirty practice under the holy and righteous name of Jesus Christ. Now I'd like to close this lecture in truth if Jesus were born on December the 25th the way to celebrate his birth is to keep up a feast of joy in righteousness that such a great and holy one has been birthed into the world. You should stop and reflect on what his birth into the world means and the change that his birth into the world has brought about in your life. It should be a time of prayer, a time of reflection, and a time of recommitment of our lives to the principles taught by such a holy man. That's not the way we celebrate. I want to close uh, this lecture by saying to you, dear beloved brothers and sisters, the pale horse, the Caucasian, whose nature is rebellion against God, who has produced a death and a hell all over the earth, 
has set the stage for the coming and the birth of this noble one, Jesus the Christ. Your problem is you're looking back 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, it was not time for the Messiah to come into the world. It was 2,000 years too soon. The Quran teaches us Jesus and his mother Mary were for a sign. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that the knowledge of Jesus is the great test between the world's knowledge and the divine revelation of God. And Jesus is the most misunderstood man anywhere uh, among the Muslims, among the Jews, and among the Christians. The Muslims think that the Jesus that lived 2,000 years ago died and is going to come back in the judgment. They give that credit to Jesus, not to Muhammad, not to Abraham, not to any other prophet. They say Jesus is coming in the last days with the Mahdi. And the two of them will be together. And when they come, joy to the poor and the oppressed, but great tribulation for the rulers of the darkness of this world. The pale horse is not going to like Jesus' presence in the world. And just as Herod wanted to kill Jesus before he was born, that's to teach you the mind of the rulers of the white man's world. When they know it is the time for the Messiah, they know that the Messiah is coming. They must kill the Messiah in order to prepare a future for themselves. Because if they don't kill the Messiah, the Messiah will end up killing them. It's kill or be killed. The pale horse does not want to die. So he must kill the Messiah. Now, beloved, in my conclusion, all your life you've been reading this beautiful story of Jesus. His mother, a virgin. Jesus born, no apparent father. Don't you know Mary had to hide her pregnancy? Do you know what the law was back there? That if you're found with a child and there's no man, how could Mary tell them it was the Holy Ghost? What does that mean to the Jews of that day? They said, look, where's the man? Mary, you're guilty of fornication because you are not married. They would have stoned Mary to death. She had to be hidden in order to have her baby. Hmm. Are you listening? And let me tell you something. If you're going to produce a great child, you have to be hidden today. Because your little black babies are today in the view of the Herods of today. Your male children are being destroyed right in front of your eyes. When you see your little boy babies in the first few years, you are so proud of them. They're so brilliant. They're so wonderful. They're so magnificent. You send them to school, and by the time they're seven years old, you don't see that brilliance anymore in your children. What happened to your baby? The Herods of the world have killed your children because they know that Jesus is to come up out of a dead people. He rose from the dead. 
It don't mean that a man went down into a grave and got up. It means that the world was under the death of the pale heart. But out of the death, God raised one from the dead. And he came up from among the dead with a wisdom and a power to destroy death and hell. That means the pale horse or the pale man is at the end of his time when the Messiah is born. J. Edgar Hoover was no spiritual man. J. Edgar Hoover said, we must prevent a black messiah from coming to birth among black people who will weld them together into a unity. Why did J. Edgar Hoover say that? Listen, please, beloved, this is the end. But it's going to be a Merry Christmas for you this time. The first Merry Christmas you've really had in all your life. Not Merry because your circumstances are changed, but Merry because your mind is at ease because you know the truth now. And the truth shall make you free. You ready for this? You know why the white man knows that a Messiah is coming from among you? I know you don't believe it because you don't think too much of yourself. But white people know the law that when you oppress a people for hundreds of years, out of their longing to be relieved of their oppression, they're going to produce a child that is born to deliver them from that oppression. He'll look like any ordinary child, and that's why white people will be watching your children. Because he's going to look like an ordinary child. He's going to play like ordinary children. He's going to laugh. But there'll be something unusual about this child. He'll see the same thing that others see. He'll hear the same things that others hear. But when it goes into his brain, he will internalize it and bring it back differently and people will say God I, I never thought of that before because he'll be born to make sense out of nonsense he'll be born to bring about a change the Messiah the Bible describes having hair like lamb's wool. Why don't you put your hand on your head and feet like burnished brass? He's going to look like you. In Mecca today, in the corner of the holy house, they have a stone that they call the black Stone. It's not quite black, it's a reddish brown. But a member of the black family and Muhammad kissed it. And every Muslim that goes by there kisses that stone as a sign that when the man that the stone represents comes into the world, David the psalmist said, kiss the sun lest I be angry with you, and if my anger is kindled, you shall not tarry but a little while. 
What would you do if I told you that it's you and your unequal suffering in this world that out of you who live in the house of the pale horse under the death and rebellion of the pale man in the hell produced by following the way of the pale rebellious devil that out of you the Jesus that you're looking for was going to come. He would be raised from the dead. And a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child and his name shall be called Emmanuel meaning God with us oh brother what virgin can conceive is there a virgin in the house don't speak Whenever a virgin conceives, she's no longer a virgin anymore. So in the Quran, the angel said, We give you good news, Mary, of one whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. And Mary said, My Lord, how can I have a son? And man has not yet touched me. She didn't say that man wouldn't touch her. She just said he had not yet touched me. You said, but Mary didn't have no husband, no man, not according to the Quran. And if you read the Bible carefully, it's right there. Look at the words. And the Holy Ghost came upon Mary. <laughs> oh, read it. You don't like that? You, you, you think that a woman just had a baby. And there was no man involved. Well, if she did, he can't be no example for us. Because if Jesus is perfect and pure, I can understand that. Because if God flew down from wherever he was and got married, friends, And ain't no God flew down and got my mama pregnant. Then how can God make that man an example for me when I don't have in me the same essence that Jesus had in him since Jesus was fathered by God and I'm fathered by James or John or whoever the heck it was. How can a man like that be my example? You don't understand the scripture. Come on, let's open up the book, Reverend. Paul says, Jesus was the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness. Stop right there. Joseph was of the lineage of David. Joseph fathered the body of Jesus like my father, whom I don't know, fathered this body. He was the sperm that my mother carried nine months. But my father nor my mother could call themselves the father.
father of what I have in my head nor what I have in my heart. That can't come from no earthly father. I am the son of God. was dead and destroyed but Allah blessed me to bring it back to where it is now that there's life in you breath in you I ask you who is my father I could never have done this on my own power because I have no power of my own could never have done it with my own understanding because I don't know nothing of myself. 
God is my Father. And I'm talking about a Jesus, a Messiah that God rose up among us. Why do you think the preacher, when they hear me preach Jesus, they are excited because I can preach Jesus better than preachers who claim to know him. Because you preach what you know not. I preach a Jesus that taught me face to face, mouth to mouth. I'm through now. Merry Christmas, y'all. Joy to the black man. Your Lord is come. Let the earth, the black man, receive her king. King of kings. Lord of lords. God of gods. The honorable Elijah Muhammad. black man so no more on December the 25th should you go get you a tree when they come to you with a tree I'll put that money in my pocket <laughs> aren't you gonna buy a gift for me baby the best gift I could give you sweetheart is the gift of knowledge and I've learned something, and I want to pass that on to you. It's been Mama been giving you these gifts all these years. And I told you this fat cracker came down the chimney. But I want you to know, sweetheart, it's been me and your daddy all along. And I'll never lie to you again. Tell your children the truth. And it'll be a Merry Christmas. It'll be merry this time because the Jew won't get your money this time. It'll be merry this time because the whiskey merchant won't get your money this time. It'll be merrier this time because you ain't got nothing to prove to nobody that you got to buy them a gift. You are the gift. Give yourself to your husband, to your wife, to your children, wrapped up in a new garment. Never again should we honor that which breaks the law of God. Never again. Oh, if I were here on Wednesday, I don't think I'd be here. I think I'm going on one of the most important missions of my life. I don't want to talk too much about it. But when Jesus was 12 years old, he was found sitting in the temple with the scholars and the rabbis. And he confounded them with what God had given him. And I say this to you, brothers and sisters, you don't know that wonderful man that was in our midst. Sweet little Jesus boy, born in a manger. Sweet little Jesus boy didn't know who you was. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. He was a light shining in the darkness, but the darkness couldn't comprehend it. 
You didn't know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad like we should have, but our eyes were too dim. He was a holy man in the presence of a people who couldn't see him because of the night of our ignorance, so therefore he was like a ghost. We only could make out the apparition of the form of the man, but we really didn't know the man. And like Mary, we are a virgin people. We've never had an intercourse with God. Therefore, we've never brought up from our midst a representative of God that truly exemplified the righteousness, the spirit, and the power of God. So from one generation to another, we've just been Negroes, niggers, and colored people. One generation come, another generation go, but our condition is never changed. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad laid over us like a virgin and we produced one from our midst. His teacher laid over America, Master Farad Muhammad, and produced him. And then he laid over America and produced me. And my job is to lay over America and produce by the tens of thousands replicas of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that when they look at us, they see the Father and know who the Father is. That this ain't no bastard child that you bring in saying, this is Elijah, because he know his children. They look like him. They follow his law. They obey his commands. And the virgin shall conceive. And the Holy Ghost shall come upon her. And that which is conceived within her shall be called the Son of God. His name shall be called Jesus. And he will save his people from their sins. Right now, you haven't met that Jesus. You talk him, you shout him, you praise him properly. But you're not out of your sin. There's no power in the church in its present form and condition to bring you out of the death that the white man puts you under. The preacher himself is under the same death as you. But you just come to the mosque one time. If I never see you again, you're never going to forget what you heard. And when you leave here and you go look at white folks, look at them real good. And look at the world that they've made. It's rebellion against God's law. And if you don't learn how to live, their own world will take you under. Their world is death, brother. They promote cigarettes. Yes, sir. Smoke. Take a cigarette. Come on. Get a cigarette. They promote drink. And they make you think wise people drink whiskey. Intelligent people smoke cool. Now they tell you the cigarette is killing you. The alcohol is what? Killing you. What about the pork? When you start getting high blood pressure, you go to your doctor, he says, stay off this pork for a while. Come on. Stay off red meat. Come on. Your diet is killing you. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he teach you what foods to eat, what to store in your houses. 
What a wonderful teacher. Brother and sister, I must leave you now, but to think that a man could teach us like this, that a man could teach us like this where we know the right foods to eat we know the right thoughts to think we know how to cook the food some of you are eating in aluminum pans and pots not knowing that the aluminum is poison and every little bit of aluminum that gets into the food it gets into your system it gets up in the brain and starts altering the shape of the brain cells and at a certain time you end up with what they call Alzheimer's disease where you can't remember nothing it's not old age it's you don't know how to live you've been following that pale horse Jesus came that you may have life and have it more abundantly soon I'll be 60 years old Man, I feel like a young spring chicken. I feel wonderful. I'm going to look better. I mean, I've been teaching all week long, flying and teaching and flying and teaching. You wouldn't believe it, but listen to the voice. How strong it sounds. Listen to the spirit. I mean, look, man, I am in good shape. With 20 some odd grandchildren. And if you all keep messing around, I'll be here to say prayers over you. Don't kill yourself. You can have abundant life. Come on to the teacher that will make you a son of God. I want you to be like me. I want you to be able to say, who is my father? I want your father to be able to look at you and say, son, take my hat off to you. I'm so proud that you're my son. I fathered your body, but only God can father the spirit of holiness and righteousness in a human being. And God made man in his own image and after his own likeness. The white man made a nigger after his image and in his likeness. And that's why he looks at you and he laughs at his product. But he don't look at me and laugh. When he talks about Farrakhan, you see fear and trembling. I'm telling you what I know to be the truth. You talk to the big movie stars that we have. They say, I don't know what Farrakhan has done to these Jews. They just, they're frightened of that man. And when you meet me, you sit with me in a private meeting, I'm just as soft and sweet and tender. Yes. Well, I don't mean like that. I mean, I'm like, I'm really like a little sheep or lamb. It's true. I, I don't wish nobody any harm. I don't harm nobody. But when it comes to telling the truth, I'm like a lion. And the Jews, when they visit me, they say, you're so sweet here. 
But when you get up in front of those people, something happens to you. I say, yeah, you're right. Because when I get up in front of you, something does happen to me. And the thing that happens is that this is my job. This is my what? This is my mission. And God comes in. And God comes out. And that's why the man that you see today is a different man. The Spirit of God is upon me, the scriptures say. And it is upon me. And they see it. And they're frightened by it. Can you imagine the government of America planning to kill me? Can you imagine that? The FBI went to Brother Keith's house the other day. Two of them knocked on his door. Say, yes, yeah? FBI. And guess what they told him? They said, we don't want you. Don't be afraid. We don't want you. We want Farrakhan. We want Farrakhan. Listen to this. They both shook him up. Because he don't know or believe that the vision that I had of the government's plot to kill me is actually so. And then the next day after he wrote me saying, I don't necessarily see the conspiracy, but I see the condition of our people is so grave that it lends to destruction. Then the next day the FBI knock on the door and say, we don't want you. We want Farrakhan. He said, why do you want Farrakhan? He said, he's heading up a criminal enterprise. I got so angry, brother. I wanted to go down to the federal building and just kick the damn door in. Telling you all want me? You don't know what to do with me. This is a criminal enterprise. We work hard as hell to keep the lights on, the gas on, to open up a school to educate our children. Hell, if we were a criminal enterprise, we wouldn't have to ask for no money. But the criminal...